I can't have my way? Then I'm not going to believe in God anymore. He's a jerk. <laughs> World is a sinful place. I need to be prepared. Let's crack these books. Well, that doesn't make sense. Well, that contradicts. No matter, I have a handy dandy internet to tell me what the leading apologists have to say on these matters, and I will be an expert like them in no time. Oh. But I guess I can go along with that. When all else fails, ask God. Maybe in here. Holy shit. It all makes sense. I'm an atheist. This would be funny if it weren't so sad. From this TikToker's video description, it sounds like she used to be a Mormon and then later became an atheist after undergoing some religious trauma, ostensibly because she felt gaslit by her peers telling her that her deconversion was solely the result of wanting to live an immoral lifestyle. As much as I want to use this TikToker story to highlight the evidential weaknesses of Mormonism, I have to admit that this process of deconversion and the church's reaction to it is every bit as prevalent in evangelical Christianity today. Let's go through this TikToker story to see what I mean. The video opens up with her impersonation of a non-believer who rejects God because she just wants to do whatever she pleases. This depiction more or less captures the caricature that exists in the minds of many indignant Christians who struggle to understand the genuine intellectual doubts that affect many in the church. And it's no surprise that Christians believe those who reject God do so because they just want to keep sinning. Romans 1 says that God has provided ample evidence of his existence, but people turned away from him because they suppressed the truth, exchanged the truth for a lie, and were given over to their dishonorable passions. Yet when the converts are polled on why they left their faith, we get a completely different story. The consistent testimony of these deconverts is that their churches were legalistic, anti-science, intolerant of doubt, hypocritical, and judgmental. On top of that, they often experienced personal disappointment with God in some way and struggled with problems in the Bible. I personally don't believe there's a conflict between Romans 1 and the research data on deconversion, but I want to emphasize the disastrous consequences of Christians failing to acknowledge and respond to the research data. When someone is hurting and comes to you for help, the worst possible thing you can do is dismiss their hurt and attribute it to some moral failing on their part. This kind of response damages their trust in you, alienates them from the community, and wrecks the very faith you want them to maintain. The doubter begins to think in his mind, if this behavior is what Christianity teaches, then I want nothing to do with it. The reason why it's so sad that this happens is Jesus himself responded patiently and gently to doubt. When John the Baptist sent his disciples to ask Jesus if he really was the Messiah, Jesus didn't say, go back and tell John the only reason he doubts is because he just wants to sin. Instead he said, go back and report to John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. So this TikToker isn't wrong at this point. Christians need much greater empathy when walking with people through doubt. As far as that goes, I'll be the first to say that I've seriously failed at doing this. I was a smug atheist for most of my childhood and became a smug Christian when I converted in my second year of undergrad. Although I never said it out loud, there's a part of me that always thought my choice to follow the evidence and give up certain sins in order to honor God made me a better person than these heathens who live for raw, sinful pleasure and only reject the gospel because they want to continue in their sin. I've no doubt that this attitude made me come off as extremely arrogant whenever I share the gospel with people and really damaged my witness. So yeah, the attitude she's pointing to is very real and something we all need to recognize and work on. Now the main part of the video depicts what this TikToker says was her actual process of deconversion. She begins to read the Bible and other Christian literature and comes across things that don't make sense or that seemingly contradict one another, so she turns to the internet and consumes apologetic material to try to answer her questions. But as she does so, she finds that the answers aren't satisfying, they confuse her even more and her questions remain unanswered. Nevertheless, she temporarily feels like her doubts have at least been addressed, but inevitably they resurface and she collects more and more unanswered questions. 
So she turns to prayer, hoping that God will work a miracle to ease her doubts, but nothing happens. This same process of googling apologetics answers and praying for the doubts to go away continues for years, 20 years in fact, according to the video, until she finally realizes that she just doesn't believe anymore. In the end, she admits that she is actually an atheist. Of course, this is supposed to be an exaggerated, comedic sketch, but it's actually not too far off from reality. In the deconversion literature, this is exactly the experience described by many deconverts. In his PhD dissertation in which he interviewed 24 deconverts, John Marriott notes the role that apologetics played in the lives of three individuals, Steve, Frank, and Wayne. As believers, they studied apologetics passionately and memorized arguments to share with their friends, believing the arguments were strong and convincing. But later on, as they studied more and became exposed to atheistic objections, they realized that the arguments weren't so good after all. Now at this point, it's tempting to say that these guys just didn't do enough research. If only they'd come across this or that apologist, watched this or that video, and read this or that book. All their doubts would be blown away. They just weren't serious enough about finding answers to their questions, and so they gave up. And secretly, it was because they'd already made up their minds, they just wanted to make it look like their doubts were intellectual rather than emotional. Again, this response from indignant Christians is all too common and evokes the same Pharisee condescension. I'm not immune to this criticism because there was a time when I thought this too. The truth is that many deconverts consider themselves very serious Christians who are very involved in their churches, and they took investigating their doubts with the same seriousness. When committed believers encounter doubt, they don't just lightly dabble in apologetics. They consume it vociferously to try to rescue their shaken faith. And it's not that they're too dumb to understand advanced apologetic arguments either. Frank studied apologetics and theology in college and has a PhD in philosophy. In fact, he says it was through studying philosophy that he found his apologetic arguments untenable. The picture of the nominal Christian who watched a couple apologetics videos and wasn't convinced because they'd already made up their minds is really a gross caricature of what the converts are really like. So what do we make of this? Is apologetics useless? Is Christianity intellectually bankrupt after all? Well, the deconversion research consistently shows that there's a wide range of reasons why people lose their faith, and there isn't a single obvious trend. Not everyone goes through the exact same experience. Different things raise different doubts in different people, and people respond differently to different attempts to help them. I personally think the arguments in mainstream apologetics are very powerful and compelling, and it's undeniable that they've done wonders for bringing some people back to faith. Yet for others, the arguments are utterly unconvincing. That's just how reality works. We're complicated people living in a complicated world. For the same reason, there isn't an obvious solution for helping those with doubts maintain their faith. What this means is that we shouldn't be looking for a silver bullet. The Christian response should be as diverse and multifaceted as the doubts that lead people to deconvert. Apologetics alone isn't enough to keep people from leaving because they also need a loving church community and a tangible sense of God's presence in their lives. In other words, the church needs to grow in every aspect of relational ministry. Personally, I think a lot of the doubts that deconverts had prior to leaving Christianity stem from poor theology inherited from the fundamentalist churches they grew up in. These are churches that insist on an extremely rigid and literal reading of the Bible, de-emphasize the human authorship of scripture, boogeyman modern science, shelter congregants from outside ideas by decrying them as evil, demand conformity to strict behavioral norms, and shame those in the church who voice disagreement. The black and white view of Christianity that these churches teach sets people up for failure when they inevitably encounter people and ideas outside of their fundamentalist Christian bubble. If we want to stop the trend of deconversions, these things have got to go. Fortunately, from what I've seen, mainstream evangelical Christianity has already begun to move away from this kind of thinking, so I think we're headed in the right direction. At the end of the day, despite this TikToker's attempt to ridicule Christians, the process of deconversion it points to is very much a real phenomenon, the typical Christian response to which ought to terrify us. We need to recognize that deconverts generally aren't obstinately rejecting Christianity. Rather, they're experiencing a loss that comes from an inability to reconcile the faith they inherited with their experience of the real world. We also need to recognize that the loss continues long past deconversion. It's so painful to strain your relationship with your disappointed parents, friends, and church family, 
and to have to re-establish your identity after a big part of your childhood is gone. I can somewhat relate to this, as I felt and continue to feel mocked and shamed by my family and my secular friends for converting to Christianity, but it's far worse for deconverts because unlike Christian converts, they often don't have a community that celebrates their choice and helps them through the change. This is something that we as Christians need to understand to meet people where they're at. The solution isn't stubborn hostility or resignation. The solution, as it's always been, is patience and love. If you know someone who's struggling with doubt, or if you simply want to better understand why people deconvert, I highly recommend the book Before You Go by John Marriott and Sean Wicks. I promise it's not an apologetics book. They call their project Theological and Philosophical Therapy, which is meant to provide counseling to those who want to hold on to their faith but are struggling to do so while maintaining their intellectual integrity. The key argument in the book is that despite what we might think, many of our beliefs are largely driven by our values, culture, and emotions, while reason and evidence are primarily confirmatory of our predispositions. They affirm what we already believe and give us intellectual permission to continue believing it. This is true of everyone, no exception. I want to be very clear that I'm not saying intellectual doubt is always illegitimate or insincere. The objections most often raised against Christianity are genuine problems that deserve to be addressed head-on. Nor am I saying that people should ignore their intellectual doubts and unreflectively persist in their faith. Intellectual integrity demands that we only believe what we think is true and have good reasons for believing it. What I am saying is that we need to take a long, honest look at ourselves to understand the underlying non-rational factors that might lead us to find certain arguments more convincing than others. The hope is that after wrestling with our doubt and understanding why we have them, we might be able to look at the evidence as objectively as we can and eventually come to a place of intellectual peace with wherever we land.